Barbara, in your experience, what are the connections between violence and being in prostitution? Um, and the thing that connected is that um, seeing that I've been, and, and I have to say this because if not, then you wouldn't know. But seeing that um, I was prostituting probably every side of Central Ohio, um, along with it came abuse, came rape. I've been raped 27 times. Not once was anything reported due to the fact of being scared of what would be done. Um, nobody cares, and my voice was not heard. Um, along with being trafficked came with you do this, um, or this will happen to you. Uh, seeing that it started at a very young age, um, seeing that I've seen abuse in the home and my mother's day and things of that nature made me feel like when the abuse started happening to me that that was love um, and the attention that I wanted. So I started looking for love in all the wrong places. And I guess, you know, that's exactly what I've got. How can survivors make a positive impact on helping others who have been um, in your shoes? Well, seeing today that um, the programs that I've graduated and seeing a lot of the knowledge that I've gained from being a victim, because um, at a time I didn't think that I was a victim. You know, um, I thought that I was just straight to the problem. You know, nothing else was going on. It was just me being out there, walking around, jumping in cars, or being led astray by different men telling me who to go with and what to do and, and things to that nature. Um, I would say that the information that was gained um, through the awareness of trafficking today has made me want to be so involved with not only the young generation, but women that don't have a clue that they have been trafficked. It, it, it goes on at many different jobs, um, different things of that nature. Um, today, I, I try to stay involved with going into the prisons. Um, I'm about to go into CMC and RIW to um, talk to women and run a class for women that are 60 days of getting out of prison to bring the awareness so that they won't go back to what it is that they were doing and seeing that I've been a project myself, been in prison three times, been incarcerated 25 times. The things that I go back to is the things that I'm used to. So if I don't know nothing different, then I'll continue to do the same thing that I do, and that was prostitution and being involved in trafficking. It's very important to make these young women aware because the first thing you look at is runaways. When you look at a runaway and you see a girl and she's walking down the street and her head is held down and her arms is wrapped around her or um, she just looks to be like caught up in her, caught up in herself, you particularly don't think that that's what's going on. But I think the awareness that's brought up today is people can look and say, hey, something is going on. And we really uh, should take a stand in trying to better the city because the things that I've heard before we got up here, I, I was thinking to myself, like, wow, where was they when I was sick? Where was, where was you guys when I was 16 years old? Where was the programs to, to say, hey, if you see a young lady walking down the street, you know, cops rolled past me many times, and um, they, they didn't ask me, you know, are you, are you a runaway? Um, you know, are you out here on your own? You know, um, so. That's, that's what I want to say, how that affects me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, next we have Vivian. Vivian, will you please introduce yourself? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Vivian. I am 46, and I'm from Marysville, Ohio, I'm a small country town. Um, my mother died when I was 12. Um, However, my trafficking started within my family, um, and it was um, a lot of secrets amongst my family. Um, and I'm, I still would never know if my mother knew or not um, to this day. Uh, she worked a lot. She did the best she could raising us. Um, I know that. Um, however, she had um, seven brothers and um, she had six sisters. They had a very big family. And um, I'm just, you know, I'm being honest with you because I want the awareness to be out there. Um, it started within my, my family, my uncles. 
Um, they were grooming me for a very, from a very young age. They would, you know, it started when I was eight years old. Um, they would take me to um, drive their truck. There was this was three out of seven uncles of mine, um, and they would start with letting me smoke cigarettes. Um, they would let me drive. They would give me money for candy, take me to the Dairy Queen, things of this nature. And then it ended up that I would do sexual favors for it, for each of them at different times. Whether they knew that each other was doing it to me or not, I don't know. Um, so, also, um, that's another thing that I think that mothers and fathers should be aware of. Um, because you trust your family. You trust your, you know, your families. And, you know, um, I never had, you know, the things that you, you were talking about, that the, the earlier panel was talking about, um, you know, like Barbara said, where were these people when I was growing up? I remember going to school. I remember feeling very self-conscious. I remember losing all of my self-esteem. I remember going to school smelling like cigarette smoke and um, being around, hanging around all of the wrong people, um, you know, and bits and pieces. A lot of, you know, a lot of my memory is not there by choice or, you know, I have PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder today because of this, trauma issues. And um, so, but I'm, I'm wondering if I would be sitting here today if there were some kind of classes or some kind of intervention back then from the age of, you know, uh, kindergarten to even to elementary school. If somebody could have you know, gotten a hold of me at school. Uh, you know, I, I was a runaway. Um, my uncles would even take take me to strip clubs um, at the age of 12. I mean, this went on my whole, until I was 16. Um, two of them committed suicide over, you know, the molestations of their own daughters. I mean, this, this stuff, it was very dysfunctional, my family was, but it, it's really, it really is, the reality of it is true. I mean, it does happen. So, but again, um, I was a, a ward of the state. You know, it was all my fault. But nobody intervened and said, "Hey, you know, what's going on with you? Why are you acting out in this way?" You know, it was automatically, "You're the bad person." You know, why are you staying out all day long? Where are you coming up with this money? Why are you dressed that way? You're too young to wear makeup. Why are you on the phone? You know, um, things of that nature. So, you know, that's what I have for you. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, with your experience, um, especially with the fact that it was so much a part of your family, um, how do you see um, what do you see that are, as some potential solutions to preventing young people from entering trafficking? Wow. Um, like I said, um, if there was some other, just one, just a different turn that my, my mother could have made or somebody could have intervened, I don't know whether it would have been a bus driver, you know, I don't know. Um, for for the for the team for the elementary students today, um, I I would say it would have to be teachers, um, bus drivers, um, social workers, you know, doctors. It was it was such a, a secret back then, and I just find it amazing today. I'm so glad I'm here and I'm, I'm able to help you, and I hope that I can, and I hope that I am. Um, but you know, it was just so hush-hush, 
And now that I look back, it would have been so easy to just say, hey, are you having a bad day today? Or why are you feeling? You know, why is your head down? Why are you crying? You know, um, um, so that's, that's really all I, I have for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Sarah Walter and I'm 25 years old. Since the age of 12, I've been in the cycle of uh, foster homes, living on the streets. Um, I lived at Rosemont for a period of time in psychiatric wards, and my pattern was to always run, always run to, you know, what I feared and hated the most, but it's kind of where I learned how to survive and exist in life. And as much as I hated it, that's what I continue to do, and I think um, it had a lot to do with the drugs and alcohol because you know, with all the trauma that was linked with me being in all these facilities, that that's the only way that I could handle it, and especially at such a young age. Thank you. Um, and how how do you see the role of social workers um, in assisting survivors, and how can social workers understand and better work with people who have been in human trafficking? I think the main thing is to continue to have a lot of compassion for these women and, you know, in some cases men, but um, the reality of it, have a lot of patience at the same time for these women. And, you know, see them as a victim. Don't see them as a criminal like a lot of people do because I guarantee if you set any one of these women down and they tell their story to you, there's going to be something traumatic, you know, and, and nobody, nobody in that situation wants to do what they're doing. And it's so hard to quit, and you know, I wish I had an answer for that, but I don't. Just continue to embrace these women and love them. Thank you. Elle, would you please introduce yourself? <laughs> Hello, my name is Elle Sandra Davon. I'm known as Elle. Um, I was, I currently run a program called STARS. I was um, trafficking at the age of four out of foster care until the age of nine. At the age of nine, I returned to my mother and was pimped out by my mother's boyfriend um, from nine to 11. My father was a pimp and my mother was a hoe. She was his bottom woman. And um, he, my father had a stable of 13 women. Somebody called my mother out of her name. My father shot and killed two of them and he did 25 years in prison, so I was put into the system. At the age of 11, I left my house. I started a program in Detroit called the Young Girls Incorporated. I had like 100 to 125 girls under me doing everything. Trafficking, selling drugs, all of that at 11 years old. At the age of 12, I was locked up in what's called the Adrian Trans School. It's the most, at that time, severe place that a girl could go. I was locked up until I was 21. At the age of 9, 18, I knew I was going to get out, so I set a fire and tried to kill somebody in there. So then I was placed in the Lucas County Jail. I got out at the age of 19. I was sent to Toledo, Ohio. I continued the life that I was living, being trafficked and pimped out. At the age of 28, I decided it was time to stop. I decided that God had brought me far enough that I needed to stand up and use my life to help others. So I formed a program called Wake Up Youth in 2004. I worked with the FBI task force. They came to me, approached me, and asked me if I would try to help them talk to some of these young girls. I went to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and I spoke at a conference in front of 80 FBI agents and tried to explain to them how to get to these young girls without them thinking that they were just trying to make a collar. So after I did that, they approached me, and I'm like, Pete was one of them. I was like, I ain't talking to y'all. I'm not a police. I'm not talking to you guys. But eventually they wore me down. And I, you know, talked to a whole lot of the girls and we were able to prosecute them. So, several. There's a list of them. Several of them. And um, so, that's it. But um, I hope one thing that you will take away from here. And uh, as you can tell, I'm very straightforward. So don't be offended by what I'm about to say. Because if I don't say this, other people are going to look at me and like, oh, she went out. As social workers or, or anybody else that has a degree, my favorite word is, okay, they got alphabetical letters behind their name. They earn those letters. They, they learn 
and then they earn those letters. Well, we as survivors, all of us as survivors, we have alphabetical letters behind our names too, and they're S O H T, Survivor of Human Trafficking. That's our letters. So, what I ask you to do as people in the court, social workers, or whoever you might be, is that you listen to us as survivors and listen to what we have to offer because we didn't ask for those letters. We earned them, but we didn't ask to earn them. They were given to us. So we just ask that you listen and give us a chance to try to educate you with the knowledge that we have at the same time while you educate us with the knowledge that you have. That's it. And I have to confess, this is not the first time that I've moderated a panel with Elle sitting on it. Um, that's why I think I'm allowed to call her ill. But um, my favorite quote from her is that even Jesus had disciples. And her point when she was speaking about it was that, yes, um, you know, there are social workers, counselors, law enforcement officers, people who've had education and experience to be in the position that they're in. Um, but not one person can do it. It takes a team of people. Um, and to include survivors of human trafficking in that. So I had to, I had to give that shout out to you. Oh, thank you so very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, Vanessa, will you please introduce yourself? Hi, guys. I'm Vanessa Perkins. I'm actually from Nelsonville, Ohio, Southeast Ohio. I've never gone down now. Um, but uh, I'm really nervous, and I always feel better when I tell you I'm nervous. I even took my glasses off so I couldn't see you guys very well. <laughs> and um, I carried all that stuff with me and I had some um, childhood abuse and I like what these other ladies were talking about how, um, like Sarah said, we don't want to do this thing. I carried the sexual abuse and confusion that came with that, like I was talking about, onto my, my relationships and, um, and as I, my, my dysfunctional family was into drugs and alcohol, so that's what I was taught to do as, um, as a coping skill. And so as I'm Went through these relationships, I got this confusion about what love is and the, the approval seeking and all that. I'm taking drugs and alcohol to get rid of that yucky feeling I have inside about the, the childhood abuse that's just so disgusting that I don't know what else to do with it. So when I put something in my body, it's the only time I feel okay with me type of thing. And then that became like a serious addiction to where I was desperate to not feel that stuff anymore. The more I took, the more I needed. Like, you know, our bodies get used to things. and. And so, and my brain was just trying to balance it out. So once I started feeling normal, or normal, <laughs> whatever that is, um, I had to take more. So it's a lot of work to to get those to, to get me to not feel anymore. So I became more desperate and more desperate, and then I started doing some bad things to um, to get my drugs and alcohol to be able to just not feel all that crap. Because I grew up in the same type of family that Sophie was talking about about uh, we don't talk the secrecy that type of thing. And so when I was feeling a certain way, I wasn't taught to go and talk about it. That might help. I was taught, don't say a word. What's the state, what goes on in this house stays in this house type of thing. And I can carry that with me today. That's something that's really hard to uh, break through. And I appreciate what some of the ladies were talking about. Um, be patient, be kind, and compassionate because this is a journey. It's not like, oh, I'm better. Thanks, guys. It doesn't work like that. Like, this is a, this is a really hard, traumatic issue that is so hard for me to even know that I have a problem let alone to actually work on what I need to work on. I don't know what this stuff is. I've never done this before. And, um, and it's scary to, to relive all this stuff just to try to heal from it. And it's really, really difficult. And so um, so i tell you something that's really helped me on this journey is being around people just like me and um, that have gone through what I've gone through and that can look me in the face and say, you're not a bad person. You're, you're a victim of human trafficking. And we've, I've made some bad choices along the way. Some of it was my choice. Some of it was just because I just needed to be a high. But some of it I was forced into doing. And um, so all of it, I didn't really want to do. I just had to do it for my, to, to survive type of thing. And um, I'm just really grateful that you guys are all here and that we're trying to move this thing along together. Because this is no joke. This has been so quiet for so long. I'm so grateful that we're trying to be loud about this. That's the reason I'm sitting here. Because I'm tired of being quiet about this thing. And I'm, if we stand together, you know, just like the last time I was talking about the abolition and stand, let's move this thing. Like, this is no joke. There's little kids in the United States today being trafficked as we speak. Like, some odd thousands, I don't even remember 
it's horrible. I'm just glad to be a part of something like this to make this thing happen, you know. Bring some awareness up, stop this stuff. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs>
the door the next time. It's, it's, it's changed, and we've changed a lot of things we do in the department as far as how we're dealing with women involved in prostitution and kids involved in prostitution. So that's kind of what, what we do, and I'm sure Jake can you know, talk about the task force a little more. And Pete, what is your experience um, when encountering youth who are younger than 18 and they've been in human trafficking? Well, it, it, a lot of times, it used to be I would, I would come uh, work certain areas of the world prostitution. We'd come across a 15 or 16 year Part of my job would be to get them into my car, get them to solicit me, get them to juvenile court, take them to jail. Um, now my job is to go out and find them and get them help and not arrest them. Find out if they're being trafficked. And find out why they're being out there, why they're working. You know, if there's a dependency problem, if uh, you know, there's issues at home. It's part of the problem, part of the issues we, we do now in all of our sides do it. We come across a juvenile involved in prostitution, sex trafficking. You know, it's not. Hey, we're taking you right to jail. We want to tell you what we're about as far as the task force, what we do as far as sex trafficking. We want to prosecute your trafficker. We'd like your help to prosecute the trafficker if you'd like, um, and we kind of move on forward from there. Okay. And um, what about um, when you like when you identify a victim? They've been recovered, and what what sort of um, network do you have in place to contact social workers or counselors, people who can help with that immediate crisis situation? Well, over over the six years I've been on the task force, we've developed certain protocols um, that have been actually they're ever changing, but they're working fantastic for us. We have liaisons with uh, children's services. We know exactly who to call when we have a juvenile victim involved in prostitution. We have liaison contacts with juvenile courts, so we know exactly who to call to get the ball rolling with, with this person's case or this investigation. We have a uh, dedicated guardian ad litem that we deal with that handles all of our juvenile victims, which is fantastic, because we've had issues with guardian ad litems where they have completely uh, not cooperated this person is not going to cooperate, cooperate with the investigation, therefore we don't have a case. And, and it's very difficult. And that happens. Because we want to see the strategy go away. Uh, we have anybody in the social services. We participate in the Lucas County Human Trafficking Coalition. Uh, in the courts, we have specific judges that we go to if we need something for a victim. If, if we want this person to go in front of this judge, so there's all different, we know who to call, when to call, and they know to call us if there's a, uh, you know, a case involving a, a juvenile victim. Thank you. Um, and then we'll kick it to Jake. Um, Jake, will you please introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Jake Hardy. I'm an agent with the FBI. I've been with the FBI for 12 years. I'm the coordinator of the Northwest Ohio Violent Crimes Against Children Task Force, which Pete is on, and I've been doing that since 2008. We're one of 44 task forces and working groups nationwide that um, work uh, basically domestic minor sex trafficking. So we go after um, pimps that are working with juveniles, but we work all types of uh, juvenile sex trafficking, or all types of sex trafficking. Okay, thank you. And um, would you please give us a case uh, example of um, a human trafficking investigation and what, just what that looked like? Sure, we can do that, but I, I do want to say first that the most important thing from today, in, in my opinion, and I'll often seek this out, if there's other survivor that is on a panel or you have a chance to listen to a survivor, they, they've been through it. Um, for us as law enforcement, it's so valuable. Um, the sur survivors oftentimes will bridge the gap between law enforcement, social workers, people that haven't been through it, because uh, pimps, as a part of pimp control, teach or, or instill in their victims that law enforcement's bad and you don't want to talk to law enforcement. And the survivors are excellent in, in getting the victims to a point where they're able to at least somewhat trust law enforcement and talk. And El, El's done that um, for us for years. So that's something that, that is really, really important of this whole day. And anytime I'm somewhere, I seek out to listen to uh, the survivor stories. That helps. Uh, but we'll, we'll go through just a typical case and one that we recently had. Um, I, I think the last.
last uh, human trafficking awareness day, we talked about it in advance, and it will be, um, and how that case went down. Um, basically, uh, it starts with a, a victim with all the risk factors that um, have been talked about today, uh, the recovery of that victim. Uh, the, thing, the thing that I guess I want to bring forward or talk about is, in that particular case, the case didn't happen right away. The recovery of the victim was in 2009. The trial was in December of 2011. So if you look at that gap between the recovery of the victim and the trial, there's a lot of issues in that time frame. And we as law enforcement lean really, really heavily on the survivors, uh, the nonprofits, the social service agencies, to keep the victims basically in pocket, keep them in a position where they're able to testify. Because a lot of times, without a victim being able to testify, um, there's no case. There's not a case that can be made. And in this particular case, I just want to talk about the victim because it is, it is all about the victim. It is about that victim getting justice. And for us in the MP, you know, have to have been through this journey with this victim. She was uh, 16 at the time that she was recovered. At the time of the trial, she was 19 years old. She was pregnant. Uh, to see her get on the stand and testify at trial in front of a monster that did horrific things to her and have that monster glare at her through the whole entire trial, for us as law enforcement, I mean, I get a little choked up thinking about it. It's emotional that she's in that position where she can get in front of that pimp and testify. And that's, that's what this is about. I mean, we, we need to, to work with these victims, get them to the point, and, and sometimes we don't even get a case. We don't even make a case. For us, our number one priority is recovering these juveniles, getting them, out, getting them out of the lifestyle. But if we make a case, it takes a lot of work and a lot of patience to get to the, the end. And in that particular case, you know, that pimp was sentenced to 30 years in jail. And if you think about it, that 30 years is pretty much because of that, that victim being courageous enough to sit up there and testify. That's just a typical, that's a case from A to Z. But no, that's great. Thank you so much. And especially the support that you give and um, the consideration that you give to the, the survivors and victims that you work with. So thank you. Um, right now we're going to open up to questions from all of you. I'm going to ask that you come up here and use one of the microphones uh, because we need to make sure that our videographers get the sound. So uh, first question. Come on over. Good afternoon, I'm Darlene Jones again, and this is uh, Hannah. She had a very interesting question. She's a little nervous, and so I'm just here for moral support with her. It's a very good question. Go for it, Hannah. Since I've been involved with Stories Behind Our Eyes, I only started helping human trafficking victims, but since the police is involved, how do you know if the prostitute is set up to get in trouble or not? Like, what are the signs? Or like, because there's like, in our neighborhood, there's uh, cameras on the corners of our street. And there's this, like, one day they put the camera out, and then there's this really pretty, beautiful lady, and the clothes will fly, and really nice. Like, how would you know if that's a setup, or she was an actual victim? Well, a lot of times, police will do what you call setups. We call them stings. Uh, we will put a, an officer, an undercover officer, on the stings, and that's what we, what we do when we try to combat the, uh, the demand side of, of the sex trafficking. We call the Johns trying to be out there in the streets buying sex. Um, we also do uh, stings involving women involving prostitution on the street. We don't only really do that just to go out and arrest and, and make totals and so we can put a headline in the paper that says 21 prostitutes arrested uh, this morning. Um, a lot of times we will be out on the street talking to these women involved, not arresting them. Tell them to get off the street, taking them to uh, places where we know we can take them, where they'll be safe. A lot of times there's warrants, a lot of times there's normal choices that we have to make arrests, we have to give them a summons to appear in court. But a lot of times we're out there trying to gather information, and sometimes women on the street are the best people to talk to to find the kids that are out there being trapped. And, and, and you guys are, you know, you're going to pick it up on murder long and retire. And, uh, you know,
you know, something to think about. That girl may be staying on this. Uh, just be safe about it because the pin may be waiting around the corner. So, you know, be careful when you're out there working. Be aware of your surroundings. Um, sometimes you might not get a, a good response from the actual victim that's on the street. They're not in that position where they're wanting to talk to anybody. So just be careful when you're out there working. Things do happen on the street. Um, but, you know, anytime you see something that you think is, is human trafficking, definitely call law enforcement and, and report it, and then we'll get into it as, as soon as we can. Thank you for your question. We have nine minutes left, so there's plenty of time for more questions. I have a question. Um, since we're in the trenches of really trying to um, understand what's going on out there, and obviously we're missing it. I mean, clearly we are. And I think every generation of young people think we never get it anyway, so we're really not getting any of this. Um, you have the platform and the opportunity to give your best advice to the people who are here willing to rescue, put together lives, restore, do all the hard work that's required with love, you know, no judgment, enough of that. Um, I'd love to hear your advice for us on what we need to do either with demand, reduce demand. You know, what do we see out there? Because obviously, I don't think I truly get that yet. You know, why do we allow mind rape? Why, you know, have you thought about, I mean, what do you think about society and loving this, and here we are, where we are, and tomorrow there's going to be a new 13-year-old. So, um, with that, I'd like to start with Elle. My suggestion would be, um, there's organizations, survivor-based, or whatever, but, um, <laughs> but I'm just saying, to me, it's to collaborate. Come together. There's not, there could be 500 organizations right now in the city of Columbus, and that's still not enough for human trafficking. So, my my suggestions would be come together. You know, Marlene Carson has um, Ray Hab's house here. She's doing an awesome job, has a restaurant and everything. Maybe some of you know, maybe some of you don't. But if you don't, I'm letting you know now. She's doing phenomenal things. Um, then there's also um, Jeff Barrows has. Um, Grace Haven. I mean, there's people right here in your own city, and if you're not from Columbus, then you need to reach out. If you're from a little rural town, reach out to somewhere else and just network amongst yourselves and see what you can come up with to start the ball rolling. Because if you never start the ball rolling and you just come and listen, there's not going to be a change. There's never going to be a change. We're going to be sitting here for the next 50 years. Rahab was a prostitute in the Bible. Come on now. It's been here forever. I was just now really waking up to what prostitution is. So my suggestion is work together. I would definitely recommend to learn the red flags. Um, they're everywhere. Um, it can be something as, as clear as bruises on the wrist or the ankles. Or um, is this girl, like, does she know what city she's in? Because... They go all over the place so quickly and they're so drugged often, not everyone, but often they're so drugged that like if you see someone and they're their heads down and they're looking in confusion, ask them, like, do you know what city you're in? Do you need help? Like my thing is I have fear of asking these ladies because I've seen signs and I was I had this fear of asking them. I don't know exactly where that comes from, but I know that's something I'm definitely going to break through. And there's an eight hundred number that we can learn and um, there's ways that we could do do things as we go, you know, and I'm with Elle all the way. Okay, be a part of something. If you want to, to make a change, just like the last time I was talking about, we can't sit back and expect things to happen. We have to join something, come together, and make this happen. We also have Doma International that's here, and um, I actually work for Doma. And they have an amazing organization. These other organizations, I've, I've spoken for Grace Haven, and, and they are amazing groups to work with and really compassionate and powerful people and that you can just jump right on board with just to try to make a little bit of a difference. I know my mindset can be like, what can I do as one person? But as a group, we can, we can do some stuff. We can make some changes, you know? I mean, they thought they stopped slavery at one point in time. They, they did make some movements or whatever, but slavery is here and we can, we can move against this as well, you know? Just stand together on this thing. I'm with you on that. I like that a lot. I would say for me, um, which I do agree with, with you and Bill, was that um, to come
together because as women, we are so powerful. We are powerful women. And where it starts at first is inside of the home. You know, um, when I think about the abuse thing in the home, I look at it like my mother, I asked today, I asked my mom, why did you stay? I finally got the courage to ask her, why did you stay? This man started beating you and then as I never understood, but she was scared. She was a mother with three children, scared. She was gonna, she couldn't make it, you know, with three children, you know, what he would do, you know, things of that nature. But as me, myself, going into treatment, and I got to say this, I have been in so many programs. City of Columbus has kicked me out of Columbus and sent me to Beaton. Um, I'm back, but <laughs> thank God. Um, I know with my children, and, and I have to say this, I have four grown daughters. I brought my daughters into Catch Court with me. No program worked for me, and maybe because I didn't want it to work for me because I was not ready. When someone comes to you and they say that I have a problem, it's abuse, it's in the home, I'm being touched, you know, anything of that nature, even in social work or anything like that, you have to listen. You have to listen to what's being said, and I thought that the right thing that I can do for my children was to have them to come to catch court. I had my children to come to counseling sessions with me at Amethyst. Today, my daughters are productive. Before, they would look and say, uh, and you know, I heard the kids say, your mama crackhead or hoe. Um, and today, they don't have to live that. But as women, we have to come together, we have to stand together. When the question was asked, where do the ladies go if it could be in the middle of the night? They run in, they run in from a pimp or somebody that just raped them. I know that when I got out of the car, my head was held down and I was on my way to the next one. My voice was not heard and I was told as a child that I was worthless. I was told that I would never amount up to anything. This boyfriend that was supposed to be my boyfriend kept me in the basement, tied up at some times and drugs thrown down in the basement at me. Told my family that they owe him $125,000 to retain. So, the way that I see it is that I walked down the street, and I've got to say this because I walked down the street, I, I, was, I was a prostitute that walked down the street all day. 24-7, the police see me day and night. Why is it that they never pulled me over to ask me, was I okay, what's going on? Why are you out here? I had the police to ask me at one time, how much money had you made today? We're not going to rush you. So for me, standing today, cooperating in the system, staying involved is me giving back. Because if didn't, nobody pay attention to me. If nobody pays attention to what I've been through, and I needed women. When Doma stepped in with Catch Court and they start showing the love, we start having, and sometimes it's going to cost some money. We start having pedicures, we start having retreats. Have retreats for the ladies. Get a cabin, take them to somewhere, groom them. Show them groom in a different way. Show them groom from women instead of men. I'm not too, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't accept gifts from men. Uh, too easily now because of what I have instilled in my head what comes behind it. Um, it's a, it takes a long time for a relationship with a man for me. There, I, I just think, you know, just because of the nightmares and the things that I had, like my body was found on the rail in the bushes. I was left dead. I was in a coma three months. Um, when I came out, my children ran from me. But I'm just saying, like, the, the, the things that women need to come together and support each other in the decisions that are being made, in the funding, in the grants, you know, saying, hey, okay, we're going to come together. If you can't do it by yourself, call another program. Hey, we got this idea. Let's, let's do this. Let's come together and, and try, to, try to make this happen. 
because I'm telling you as an ex-prostitute that I ride down Main Street, I ride down Broad Street, I get out of my cars. Sometimes people don't even know this because it's nothing for me to go out there and, and be um, boisterous about. I give them red roses. Love, because that's what's like. It's love. So I don't want to take too much time, I'll talk, but um, I know I know that um, that I just, I love women and when I see them, like I used to think when people see me, like if you see uh, mug shots of me, when people see me, they lock their doors, you know, where I can just imagine what they were saying, you know, behind, you know, in their car riding down the street, I was hurting. I was abused. I was raped. Only thing I can do is to keep doing what I did to, to take care of the pain. And that was to get high and just to get in the next car for that trip that made me feel like I felt good. You know, so today I live a better life. I'm going on four years sober. It started with catch court and Judge Herbert needs a bigger courtroom. <laughs> but it started with me, um, Vivian and another young lady, it started with us. It wasn't even catch for yet, and it has grown so much. And I gradually graduated that program, and today we're, um, we have the organization DOMA to where it provides work for us. It's hard for us to get a good job. So DOMA came in and said, hey, we got Freedom Apple Card. We got something for these ladies to do. These ladies can be productive. You know, we have Heather's license. I'm the motivational speaker for DOMA. Um, you know, and, and it's just great because I can say, you know, because of my brain trauma, I don't think that I'm college material. You know, I don't think that I could pass the test, but today there's something for me to be active with, and this women in human trafficking, younger children. Thank you. Thank you.